Okay, thanks for coming today. Um, what I wanted to talk to you about today, I'm kind of psyched to be here and uh, talk about what we've been finding with some of our crop population sampling as far as how it may affect or may show us trends in our crop population. Some places it did, some places it didn't. Uh, talk about what we saw with uh, reproduction of trout in 2019, and also a couple other kind of neat things that, uh, that we've uh, noted in the sampling as well. All right, um, so the area we're talking about is about as far from where we're sitting right now as you can get to still be in New York State, uh, the far western six counties uh, of the state. And in this region, we have almost 600 streams totaling over 1,000 miles that support wild trout populations. So we got a lot of water out there to look at. Um, prior to 2016, our sampling was mostly done on just a handful of streams each year, very intensive sampling, looking at lot sites. Uh, maybe as many as 10 sites on an individual stream. We quite often only got to those streams every few years, maybe three, five, seven years, maybe more, between uh, those samples. Uh, what we were able to find out was a lot of really good information on those individual streams. Uh, as far as the adult population, what was going on with reproduction for a given year. But we didn't find out much, in, we didn't know anything about what happened in those years when we weren't getting out there. Uh, so it kind of left some questions uh, when we started looking at, at the results. Uh, so why change things? We wanted to try to get a better idea of what was going on in the trends of the trout populations. Um, and in order to do that, starting in 2016 and all the way through uh, this past sampling year, we started doing our sampling much more region-wide, uh, kind of switching things up. So from 2016 to 2019, we were sampling on 25 streams, 45 sites total. So it's really about the same number of sites we were doing other years. We were just spreading it over a lot more waters. You had one to four sites per stream. Most streams were one to two sites. Uh, and all these sites had some past survey data information to compare them to to try to start looking at some long-term trends. Uh, some of them were only a year or two. Some of them were as much as nine or 10 years of past survey data. Uh, we use two-pass electrofishing. We know three-pass electrofishing is much more the gold standard. Uh, we would get uh, more precision in our estimates that way. However, we practically we'd only be able to get one stream done a day. Uh, by doing two passes, we could get two streams done each day. Much more efficient to be able to get to that number of sites. Uh, we were looking at adult trout abundance, and that's considered yearling and older trout, the adults. Uh, and we were getting population estimates from those. Uh, we're, we're going to be talking about those in numbers per mile because the sites did vary some from year to year in length. For young of the year, because they're much harder to catch, uh, population estimates were going to we're going to have a lot bigger confidence limits. We decided to only look at the total number captured there rather than try to actually get the uh, good population estimate further. Uh, we use multiple sampling gears, and I, I want to give a few examples of these just because I know. A lot of us working within DEC, we have no clue of what other regions might be using for sampling gear. So I'll give you a quick look at what we were using for real small headwater streams. We're using battery backpack shocker. Um, these are AquaShock uh, brand shockers, and I highly recommend them. Very efficient, very simple to use, not a whole lot of bells and whistles, about half the cost of the big names. And I think right now we're the only region using these in the state. Uh, on a little bit larger streams that are too deep to wade into some of the pools with a battery backpack on, we still use the battery backpacks. However, um, AquaShock was able to build us uh, seven foot shocking wands with 25 foot cords. So we go out in the deeper pools uh, with a separate uh, operator on that. And even larger streams, we use ETS brand shocker. It's on a uh, backpack frame, and that's connected to a 3,500 watt generator on shore by two or 300 feet of quite heavy cable. Um, so, you know, that's got its downside. Um, and this allowed us to do four to 600 foot sites and we used two anode wands with that setup. And in much larger streams, we were able to use the ETS barge shocker with a generator in there. Uh, very effective setup, we can use two or three wands in there. So, used a lot of different types of gear depending on the sites. Even with two wands, we were normally getting 80 to 90% capture probabilities. So, um, we did pretty well on these. So what we tried to do is spread the streams out across the region. Uh, so our streams are spread around pretty good in all the trout-bearing portions of uh, Region 9. Uh, 
Talk a little bit about regional population trends that we saw and some things we didn't see for the three species. Start out by looking at adult wild brown trout abundance, and this is long term. When I said long term abundance is basically all the years of sampling we had at those site, uh, sites, in, in addition to our 20 through si 2016 through 2019. What you're going to see here, uh, the green dots are sites where we saw long term increasing trends in the brown trout population, adults. Uh, red dots are long term decreasing populations, yellow dots are where there's no real discernible trend. Uh, we noticed kind of some regional uh, variations going on. Start out in western Cattaraugus County, eastern Chautauqua County. We see most of the sites there have long-term increasing trends. Um, kind of good news over in that part of the region. Here's an example of one of those streams. Uh, what we're looking at, this is Clear Creek and Ellington at one of the sites. Uh, and the y-axis is numbers per mile of adult trout. You see, over time, we've had quite a nice increase overall in the adult brown trout population. Shorter term trend, you can see 2018 and 19, uh, population was down a little bit, but overall, trend increasing. We move up into the upper Cattaraugus Creek watershed, where we have quite a few of these streams located. Uh, a real mixture there. We've got some few increasing streams, Lime Lake Outlet, McKinstry Creek has some increases, uh, some decreasing, and a bunch of uh, other ones. So, we see grass that look more like that. We've got a lot of variety going on in there. Uh, a lot of ups and downs just depending on the year. And again, prior to 2016, we weren't there for a lot of years uh, to know what was going on. We do see four of the last five sampling years all the adult ground, ground trout population was down, <coughs> with the exception of 2016 at that site, which was one of our best years. So, you know, a lot going on in that one. And finally, Whiskoy Creek Watershed is our best known wild trout uh, stream and watershed in western New York, uh, and pretty consistent there. Long term, we've seen all our sites there have decreasing abundance of adult brown trout. Here's an example from one of the sites on Whiskoy Creek. Uh, you can see numbers quite high early back in the early 90s and 2000s. Uh, we do see, again, short term. From the last five sampling years, it looks like things have kind of leveled out, maybe a slight increase. So we've seen some big decreases, but hopefully the news is at least good that the decrease may have stopped and may be starting to reverse itself a little bit. Uh, now, if we look at adult brook trout, uh, long-term abundance again, uh, not as much playing going on there uh, regionally. We have a few streams that are increasing, a few decreasing. Uh, we don't have a lot of sites uh, for brook trout in this sampling. And a lot of these don't have a whole lot of survey data prior to 2016. Uh, and also from the literature it shows brook trout populations do naturally have a lot of variation going on all the time. Uh, same story for rainbow trout. Our wild rainbow trout are all caught up in the upper Cattaraugus Creek watershed. Uh, and McKinstry Creek, Lime Lake Outlet seems to be a long-term increase. A lot of the other ones are showing no discernible trend. So that's looking at the overall uh, adult brown trout abundance uh, trends that we're seeing. Switch gears to what we were seeing for reproduction in 2019 uh, for all three trout species. Okay, now what we're looking at on, on this uh, picture here, and the green dots here are where the numbers of young of the year uh, trout captured were above the long-term average of all the previous years. Red dots are where it was below. Um, and you can see with brook trout, overall, um, it was not a particularly good year in 2019, although we did have a couple sites where reproduction was above average. We look at brown trout, kind of the same thing there. We've got maybe half the sites were above average and about half below. So uh, kind of good year in some places, not in others. We see much more consistency with young of the year rainbow trout. 11 of our 12 sites uh, were below average, uh, pretty poor reproduction. And uh, that kind of turns us what? Brings up the question of why. Um, and that was touched on this morning very nicely. Uh, probably the culprit is winter and spring high flows. Uh, frequent high flows and particularly extreme high flows are really bad news for trout reproduction. If you're a trout fry who's just hatching up out of the gravel and that happens, you're pretty much out of luck. Uh, and if that happens, is a large enough event, especially if you've got ice involved, you can scour and lose those reds completely. Um, 
So that's the most likely thing. If we take a look at this graph of USGS gauge at Cataraugus Creek at Gowanda, what we see from the fall of 2018 to the spring of 2019 is a hell of a lot of water. Uh, the yellow dots in there are the median flow for the date in 77 years of record. Uh, so you can see most of that period of time was above, uh, above median flows. Uh, if we kind of break it down a little bit, the period of time where brook and brown trout fry are first swung up out of the gravel, uh, it's kind of mixed. We do see some periods in there where if they were coming out during those high flows, they're probably done. Uh, on the other hand, we do have some periods there where the flow was at or below median. Uh, so that may explain why we saw a lot of mixed results for brown and brook trout numbers in 2019 for young of the year. Uh, and if we look for the spring spawning rainbow trout, the majority of the days where those fry would have been hatching out were above median flow, uh, which may explain why the rainbow trout appeared to have a much poorer reproduction in 2019. Um, so, and that you know goes right along with, with what was talked about this morning. Uh, and that's where climate change comes into this. We're starting to see a lot more graphs that look like this uh, than we used to. I'm not a meteorologist, but just looking out my window, uh, times like this in the winter when we get two inches of rain on top of the snow. That's happening pretty frequently. So that kind of brings up the question, does the strength of reproduction uh, equal abundance of adult trout later, uh, later on in future years? And the literature for stream cell mines certainly shows that most of the time that's the case. Uh, if you have years of good reproduction, subsequent years will quite often be good uh, and I'll carry through to adulthood. So take a quick look at what uh, we were seeing uh, and it's not time to go into a lot of it, but just what we what we saw in one particular case here. Uh, the answer for us is yes and no. We saw uh, examples of both of this. This graph is at our site on Clear Creek uh, in our cave. Uh, we've got a lot of Clear Creeks in Region 9, so we have to name the town there in as well. Uh, for Young of the Year Rainbow Trout, we can see a couple things going on. First of all, from 1995 through 2007, we had some variability in reproduction, but overall it wasn't great. Maybe two fold differences. After 2007, we got reproduction of rainbow trout all over the place. Everything from nothing to a couple of best years that we had in 2016 and 2018. Really strong reproduction. So then we, with sampling every year, we can go back and say, well, what did that do to the adults? And remember, uh, again, 2016 was a great year for reproduction, and sure enough, 2017 we saw a high level of abundance of adult rainbow, uh, rainbow trout, mostly yearlings, so it did carry through. However, after 2018, which is a great year of reproduction, numbers were way down in 2019. So we saw, in one case, uh, strong reproduction did lead to a lot of adults, another one it didn't. So it's kind of a mixed bag of what we're seeing as far as that carrying through, and that may be a result of just not having a lot of uh, a lot of sites going on. Okay, another trend we're seeing is a lot more larger trout, large brown trout being found in our streams, a much higher abundance of that, it's becoming more common. I'll call large brown trout greater than 15 inches. Uh, as an example from Wiscoy Creek, looking at, uh, this is the abundance of uh, brown trout greater than 15 inches per mile, uh, for all our sampling sites we did each year. You can see from 78 through 2006, very consistently, five to 10 per mile. Starting in 2009, it increased quite a bit, two to three times some years. Uh, and you might say logically, well, you've got a lower abundance in that time period, so they're surviving and growing better. However, we're seeing the same thing on streams where adult brown trout abundance did increase. So I think there's more to going on than just that. It may be, one of my pet theories is, uh, we all know that most people that catch large brown trout are people that know what they're doing. And I think that we may be starting to see the older folks that knew how to catch large brown trout that eat them are aging out of the fishing population. Uh, and the younger folks that do know how to catch those are releasing them. That may be why we're seeing bigger fish. Whichever the case is, we're seeing a lot more of these, which is pretty exciting. Uh, one other really interesting thing that we're seeing that we didn't really expect to see coming out of this is we're catching some of these large brown trout and we're starting to be able to name them because we're seeing the exact same fish out of the exact same pool year after year. Uh, we tell this by the very unique spotting, particularly on adult brown trout, big brown trout, 
the spotting doesn't change from year to year, and it's really kind of unique, and you can tell these individual fish apart. Here's an example of one from Lime Lake Outlet, kind of unique spotting on that fish. Uh, same fish, same pool, 2016, 17, and 18. Here's another one from a, a nice little stream called the Ram. There's a 19, fish a little over 19 inches in 2016, same fish in 2017. Same fish again, 2018, same fish in 2019. That fish grew about one inch over those four years. Uh, so that's telling us a couple things there. Uh, one more example in Wiscoy Creek, a 17 inch fish in 2016 and 2017 is grown a little. 2018 and 2019, the same fish. Uh, the fish has grown slightly over two inches in four years. Uh, so we're seeing some big brown trout with, you know, what seems to be real good site fidelity to like not the same site but the same undercut bank in the same pool uh, from year to year and uh, these fish are not growing very much they're, and they're likely very old trout uh, which probably makes the importance of these being caught by anglers and, re and released a lot more important because it takes a long time to get these fish this big. Um, and it's also nice to see that they survive encounters with us. We kind of wonder that sometimes especially with these big fish. Uh, and it does appear that a lot of them are. Uh, so summary, uh, we are seeing some regional trends for adult brown trout abundance, uh, at least in some cases. Those trends are much less abundant for rainbow and brook trout, uh, probably at least partly because of less sites for those. Uh, we do see, just as the literature points out, uh, that young of the year success is closely tied to flows in the winter and spring. Uh, Kind of contrary to some of the literature, or a lot of the literature, our number, you know, young of the year numbers are not always showing up in later years as adults. That may indicate they're being lost as, um, uh, as adults rather than young of the year, so things maybe like predation. Uh, increases in larger wild, wild brown trout throughout the region, uh, and finding these large, long-lived, large sedentary brown trout. I do put sedentary in quotes there because I realized that same fish may have moved a quarter mile up and down the river every night to feed and 20 miles to go spawn uh, in the fall. But certainly at the same time in July, they're back in that same pool. So I'd like to acknowledge our uh, technicians in Region 9 uh, that do all the hard work, schlepping the heavy equipment around. We also do get a lot of help from Fish and Wildlife Service staff, Lake Erie Unit, and especially angler volunteers. On average, we've got about 80 to 90 angler days a year uh, from these volunteers that come out and help us. It's a great opportunity for them to see what's really out there. Uh, and probably every one of them goes and tells half a dozen of their friends what's really in the creek. And that's getting a lot of good word out there. So I don't know if I left any time for questions, but uh, we do. Time for one question? <laughs>